Let's let's get started. Uh, uh, great. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Gregory Hemming, and I'm co-founder and senior advisor to the Center for Local Prosperity. And uh, I'm your host this evening for this tonight's dialogue, which is titled Empowering the Rights of Nature Revolution in Atlantic Canada. First of all, I want to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And we acknowledge them as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We have a special in, uh, individual with us tonight, Elder Albert Marshall, who I would like to ask to open with a prayer. Albert. Thank you. Kuchino. Kucharamelu, we will add here. Kilanandi, you will have a big number. Well, I am very much here than this, you will have a big number. It is my name is Quanta Lime, Italy, and I'm a young. It am more than a local crosswalk and a hanky dash warren. Crosswalk and then maybe dig a hanging number. I had a more than one time in Kamla Munna. I'm on what taking me at a half to the to what happens to honest to the war on it to what making no need. Well, I am very much here than this, a court is my name. So, Grandfather, our Creator, we ask you to look upon us in a good way and accept this small offering of a sweet grass that we have prepared. We are here together to be of one heart, one mind, as you have intended for all your creation to be. Look upon us in a good way. You have given us our minds, and so we are called upon to think and to use what we have been given to help those who are in need. We are gathered here so that, might, so that we might gain knowledge what we might gain knowledge that we need and which comes from beyond ourselves, that we might have a, an insight and vision. And we need to consider the right things to do and to make right decisions wisely and, and the right ideas and to share with one another the greatest gift of all, ourselves. We call upon the spirit of renewal and the spirit of healing that support us on either side as we walk along this trail of life. That we might be renewed again as people. That healing be in our nation, in our communities, in our families, but most importantly, within ourselves. That as caretakers, we might find healing and have the wisdom and strength to walk any path set forth by you, grandfather. As you gaze upon Mother Earth, you can see the great, great spirit of life. And now we are placed at the center of this life. That we follow this path that you, our creator, has picked for us to follow. And with this, and with this kind of, of all seeing eyes, we too might understand our purpose in this life and accept it to the, accept it to the fullest. As caretakers, we walk upon this earth to be reminded that our path through life be one of love, understanding, compassion, healing, and thanksgiving. We send this offering with one voice and ask for the blessing that we need to do the work that is yet ahead of us. And may the great spirit use the sun to lighten the path for us to gain wisdom, knowledge, and healing. And may the Creator use the moon to give us peace, serenity, and strength to us all. So when our journey ends here on earth, like the fading snow, we can see each other with straight eyes and meet without shame. And now we also ask a blessing for the two-legged, the human beings. They are so much out of balance. 
I need you to return to the old ways and bring forth love, compassion, and appreciation. Thank you very much. Apollonio. Thank you, uh, Elder uh, Marshall. I pr appreciate that. I'm going to uh, take a minute and set a little background for these dialogues, and uh, and, and then uh, I'll turn it back over um, to Albert. Uh, really, since 2014, the Center for Local Prosperity has been engaged in conversations, uh, in workshops, conferences, uh, publishing information, really on on local economics uh, and and energy local food, and in 2017, in partnership with the Thinkers Lodge, uh, we expanded that into uh, a climate change, uh, the youth movement, um, uh, treaty, uh, treaty rights, um, and, and now the whole uh, idea of potential climate and societal collapse. Uh, and these dialogues are our introduction into that societal a breakdown piece because of the climate induction. Uh, so that, that's why we're, we're here tonight. Uh, this is uh, it's a two hour dialogue. And if you have questions, if you just type it into the question and answer box in the last 30 minutes, uh, uh, we will try and get to as many questions as we can. Oftentimes I try and combine questions if there is a similar thread between it. Um, uh, I, I appreciate our speakers taking the time and I know they're all dedicated to, uh, to, to the work. And I've always been moved, not just by the science of it or, or the information, but the, the more personal story of why we do the work that we do. So I'm gonna share something, uh, a dream that I had just briefly when I was living in the Yukon, small cabin at the mouth of the An uh, huge Andaluvian Valley uh, at the base of the Kalwani Ranges. Uh, and, and I heard a dream, I had a dream of, uh, I could hear a distant, and I wrote this down, it's in a little publication I have, so I don't, I, I don't forget it. Uh, there was a, the dying howl of a lone wolf that I imagine wandering deep in the Alsac Valley along the moonlit ridge above Summit Creek. I can foresee a time in which this howl may be for a mate no longer of this earth. Alone and in search of some other living wolf, it moves, stalks, yellow eyed, searching for some other living wolf, uh, walking the, uh, the gray light of the valley floor, breathing very cold Arctic air into its lungs. It is unaware of the utterly devastating fact that it is the last wolf. So it's that sort of motivation that keeps me doing this. Um, uh, so as a way to open this, I just grabbed a couple of headlines in the newspapers today. It's not hard to find news about this subject. So I just grabbed a couple. Here's one. More than 60 wildfires rage across Western Canada and the US. Thousands have been forced to evacuate from Alaska to Wyoming amid soaring temperatures and a drought. Scientists say human caused climate breakdown and decades of fire suppression that increases fuel loads have aggravated fire conditions across the region. Another one. Scientists have warned that humanity is causing the sixth extinction in the planet's history driven by overconsumption of resources and overpopulation. One million species are at risk of extinction, largely due to human activities. Another one, the Amazon River is now emitting more carbon dioxide than it is able to absorb. The emissions amount to one billion tons of carbon dioxide a year. The, most of the emissions are caused by fire, many deliberately set to cleared land for beef and soy production. But even without fires, hotter temperatures and drought means that southeastern Amazon is becoming a source of CO2 rather than a carbon sink. And here's a couple pieces of good news that's gonna set us on the course for tonight. 
just in the newspaper yesterday, there's a small community in Colorado, a little place, a little mountain town that I know well in, called in Netherland. They just passed a, a, res, uh, a resolution recognizing the, the rights of, of a body of water. The Netherland town board last week voted five to one to approve a resolution to recognize the inherent legal rights of Boulder Creek and Boulder Creek watershed. Netherlands trustee Alan App was instrumental in pushing the resolution forward. Quote, I think it makes sense to think about ecosystems when you're making decisions. He went on to say, the right of nature does not have legal standing. It is a resolution that expresses a community value that we look to at the that we look at the big picture when we make decisions. And the last thing in a conversation a day ago, I had a conversation with some people in Alberta that are working hard to do this same sort of thing on legal rights for nature on the Athabasca River in Alberta. And it's really centered on the traditional knowledge overview of the Athabasca River watershed. So um, tonight, uh, our dialogue is on the rights of nature and litigation as both outcomes and tools to adapt to climate change and societal breakdown in Atlantic Canada. And our speakers tonight are Elder Albert Marshall, an elder of the Mi'kmaq Nation. He lives in Eskazoni First Nation in Unamagi. Tina Northrup is a lawyer at East Coast Environmental Law. Sarah McDonald is a staff lawyer with Eco Justice. And Pierre Olivier Boudreau is the director of the Conservation for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society in Quebec. That was instrumental with his leadership in declaring uh, the uh, a Rights for Nature resolution uh, for the Magpie River. So the topic tonight is really a system of laws that do not represent all members of a society and the natural world equally serves neither. This li uh, a dialogue on litigation and a Bill of Rights for Nature will help Atlantic Canadians demand and benefit from a more, more holistic jurisprudence. An overarching view of this issue was stated recently by David Boyd, a member of the World Commission of Environmental Law in his, in his book, Rights of Nature. And David, I think, said it all, and he puts this challenge in front of us. To move from exploiting nature to respecting nature requires a massive transformation of law, education, economics, philosophy, religion, and culture. So I think uh, we're aware that this is not an easy challenge, but it is worth the dialogue, I believe. So with that, I'd like to turn it uh, back to Albert to give us his view of this rights for uh, nature revolution. Uh, Albert, please. Thank you very much. And the old idea is to um, try to wrap around the idea of this concept of Tawaisin. Tawaisin is very simple for us, that we always use that perspective and, and, and always make an effort as to how can we constantly change our narrative to improve our actions so that they be much more ecologically sustainable. And the other two concepts I'd like to bring forward, of course, is as a, as a guiding principle, and which is nature has rights. Humans have responsibilities. And since we have lawyers here in present, I think we, sh we should also include the loss of nature has to supersede the loss of man. And I think if we can work around that context, then I believe the essence of the spirit of Tawaisin then will be transformed into an action. But this concept was meant and it was intended 
at any time we invoke our two, our, 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 our two perspectives. When we look at everything from our individual lens, I as an Aboriginal, I see everything from my Aboriginal. From, my, from, from, my, from that lens, I see everything from what has brought forth to me by my ancestors, about how I should live during my short stay here. And then, of course, there was other concepts like medical was, 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 was brought forth. Medical link, of course, gives you the privilege to, to use, utilize the gifts of the creator. But it's a constant reminder that every action you take cannot and will not compromise the ecological integrity of the area. Because in the forefront, in the foremind mindset, our, our actions today, our actions today as an Aboriginal person, must, not just to adhere those, those principles, but also to ensure that the next seven generations will also have the same opportunities as we have, and hopefully better opportunities as to how they will go about utilizing the gifts of the Creator and how they can sustain how they can sustain themselves as well. To be able to appreciate nature by listening and learning from her. Because in those concepts, it's a, it's a constant reminder how interconnected and interdependent we are. And it's a constant reminder that we are not the superior being here. We're just a very small part and parcel of us. She's the one that determines how this, this beautiful creation of ours will function. So if, if two I see and then it becomes a norm, it has to be, it has to be used in which it be in, it will always be action oriented. And that's in, in that way there, you know, we look at everything from another perspective. For, you know, for example, um, if and when a project is proposed. We have to very look at it very carefully that this project will not compromise the ecological integrity of the area, nor will compromise the cleansing capacity of the system. Because I, 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 I dare say, I don't think we need a rocket scientist to tell us today that we have actually exhausted the carrying capacity of the system. And we have also ex exhausted the cleansing capacity of the system. That's why we have such a severity in some of those weather conditions. So to me, there is an urgency in which we have to be very diligently focusing on how do we transform our actions and activities so that we can begin to, to, to draft a new narrative as to how we will go forward in a much more ecological sustainable way. Because I don't believe that we have time. I believe we have to take this very seriously and think about it as Action has to be, some action has to be done now. But I understand, but I do believe with all these wonderful con intentions that have been demonstrated across our, across our, across our great country here. But yet, no one is talking about protecting a very source of life. And I would challenge this, 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 this uh, initiative if we could be bold enough and draft up some kind of a declaration, just like what some of our neighbors did, as Gregory mentioned, some words about water, and includes the, includes these four, four domains, air, water, and soil. 
unless they are protected, unless they are put in some kind of protected mechanism. The rate of destruction will still be ongoing because for some reason, science and technology has been sort of, has been used to replace the creation. As wonderful as science and technology is, we don't believe it can transform our natural world into human creation. And having said that, then I believe collectively, we have to find a way, humbly, how to transform a, a, another, uh, how do we come up with a, with a transformative change by constantly extracting or looking, reflecting of where we came from and how we got here and at the chaos and the pressure that we have put upon the very source of life in which we all depend upon. Because every living thing has a purpose. And that every little thing, every living entity, I believe is referred to as a biodiversity. Because you need more biodiversity to generate and to maintain a healthy system. So I believe it's essential that we amplify our voices collectively to the government and to the policymakers that it cannot and should not be business as usual. That we will put all our efforts forward together and begin to draft up this transformative change in which it will be, it will be, our main objective would be no action will ever compromise the ecological integrity of the area or the strength and capacity of the system. Now, as wonderful as science and technology is, I believe we have created a monster. That monster is out of balance now. And I believe we can transform that monster, not just to be the, not just to be the arm of destruction, but also the harm of healing and mitigation. Because of all the things that technology has brought forth, all those toxins that have been put on the surface, they're all still sitting in some settling pond. Where in the hell, where in the heck is this technology that we cannot use that technology to mitigate and to heal and to, and to, and to restore some of those, some of those damages we have done. Yes, economics is, is, a, is, a, is a critical component. And I too honestly and believe that if we shift our narrative, we wouldn't have to compromise those economic opportunities in which people depend upon and use, and, and, and use that energy to, to, to be the helping hand in which our Earth Mother solely needs because the rate, of, the rate of extraction and the rate of consumption with, with toxins, she cannot regenerate herself and she cannot heal herself. And as a result, it's, we're just getting a little glimpse of it now in some part of, in some part of our Earth where these extreme conditions are ongoing. And I believe as well that if, if no action is taken soon, how are, how are we going to uh, stop this melting of the ice caps, or polar, whatever you want to call them? Because I believe if, if they are not stabilized, do we really know what the repercussion will be? Do we really know how much, how much the water will rise? to areas that, that, that will be very vulnerable and there'll be a lot of displacement. So I believe, in my humble opinion, we should take this effort. We are now fighting for our existence. 
we no longer can stand by and, and allow the government and the industry to constantly compromise our, 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 our living and, and, and compromise the future generation. And, but I believe we have to somehow be very determined and to amplify our voices so the other groups around globally and nationally and regionally would be somewhat found some empowerment because who, who can deny the fact that this climate change is not a local issue, regional issue, or national issue. It is a global issue. And whatever, whatever, whatever we do to whatever we do to it here, ultimately inevitably affects and vice versa. So the onus, I, I beg, is upon us now to put our hearts and minds together. And in in drafting this transformative change, what it would look like. It has to be, we have to draw it in a way in which we extract the lessons, lessons, lessons of some of the actions that have been done in the past, and use those lessons learned so that the that not only our survival, but also the survival as we as we say for the next seven generations. So I, I, I believe we have the energy, we have the ability, but I think we, we only need some kind of a willpower in which we would come forth and, and say to the government and to the policymakers, this cannot continue. This rate of, this rate of extraction, this rate, this rate of contamin contaminating our air and our water cannot continue if we're, going, if we're going to survive. Because again, our Mother Earth does not need us, but we solely depend upon her. So let's all roll up our sleeves and, 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 and get to work of not just drafting, but making sure that not only individual action, but collective action would be upon one, one mind, one heart, and that is, we can we can we can we can continuously coexist with our Earth Mother without causing her so much harm and destruction, like we have we have up to date. And I believe one way, as I suggested, I think we need some kind of a, a strong language in which those sources of life. Has to have, has to be protected by the by the by, by the laws of man. And if that can happen, then the current regulatory systems will have to draft up their own legi new le legislations, and in which any development before it can be before it can be allowed to to operate, will out, will, it has to be made sure that this development will not compromise the ecological integrity of the area. And if it does, that project should never be allowed unless it can be somehow mitigated and restored by, by, by the hands of the Romans. Thank you very much. Albert, Albert, thank you. When, um, it, um, it's been always the mission, I suppose, the goal of the Center for Local Prosperity is to try and come up through with, through dialogue and conversations with something that is actionable and something that uh, uh, we discovered that a lot of these answers are already out there, but they can be replicated in from one area to another. And um, with that in mind, uh, I, I came across the, the work of Pierre Olivier on the, uh, the Magpie River, uh, because I think that is a project that can guide us through a lot of these issues. Um, and um, and I suppose might be able to, to begin this narrative that, that, that you alluded to. Pierre, uh, uh, if you could enlighten us on your work, much appreciated. 
Bonsoir tout le monde. Euh, merci, euh, merci. Je suis content d'être avec vous. Euh, merci pour l'invitation. Merci euh, à Gregory au Centre uh, Center for Local Prosperity. So good evening everyone. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Gregory and uh, the Center for Local Prosperity for the invitation for this, uh, this very interesting dialogue tonight. Um, uh, Gregory invited me to share, uh, as you mentioned, uh, or experience um, in granting the Magpie River, Muteheko Ipu, um, the um, illegal status, uh, legal personhood status. Uh, that happened uh, actually, that ended up uh, in, uh, in February, last February. So um, maybe a few words about me. I'm a, I'm a biologist. Uh, I work for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, which is uh, an environmental uh, organization. Uh, we do have a chapter uh, in, in Nova Scotia, but we, have, we actually have chapters uh, in, in every province and territory in Canada, except uh, Prince Edward Island. I'm working for the Quebec section, uh, and our work at CPAWS is to uh, protect the spaces that the people love, the natural spaces that are important. Um, so uh, I started working on the, and I do actually do have a a visual support because I want to show you some great pictures of this river that we're... so anyways while this is <laughs> loading so uh yeah I started working on, on a, a campaign if we can say so to uh to protect the magpie river um actually my organization started working on the started being interested about the magpie river in 2009 when we were uh, contacted by a local group of paddlers um, who were actually running the rivers since decades. And um, this is a picture of the Magpie River. Uh, the, the Magpie River is located in uh, northeastern Quebec. Uh, it's, it's a 300 kilometer river uh, that spans from the border between Labrador and Quebec and that goes uh, into the St. Lawrence. So it's a very long river. Uh, there's a lot of rapids on that river because the, the Labrador Plateau is very high. Um, and uh, that's, that's actually what, what, what the, the local paddlers told us uh, is that the, the river actually had a, an international recognition uh, even back in 2009, 2010. Uh, and they were uh, anxious about the river being uh, targeted for, for hydro development by our energy state company in Quebec, Hydro-Quebec. Uh, the Magpai River had been put in their strategic plan back then, uh, and they were anxious that the, the river such as this was uh, ranked among the top 10 rivers um, in, in the world for whitewater activities by magazines such as the prestigious Nat National Geographic or, and a bunch of other magazines, specialized magazines. Uh, they were worried that this, this would be a huge loss if this river would be uh, dammed. And at that time, another river, uh, which is actually the twin river uh, of the Magpie River, the, it's called the Roman River, Rivière Romaine. Uh, it was actually uh, in a big, into a big controversy, and now the the river, the Roman River, is is being you know uh, uh, is being dammed. They're they're building the fort uh, complex uh, on on the river, so. Um, so anyways, uh, the, these paddlers contacted us back in 2009 and we started uh, working um, on, on a campaign to protect the river with different partners. And I'm, I'm going to make a very long story short here, but uh, you know, through time we started a petition, uh, we conducted a study to see if the Magpie River was so exceptional. The answer was yes. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we, we talked to local representatives, provincial representatives, uh, we made presentations about the, the, the river uh, in, in big cities in Montreal because it's, it's, it's not that known in Quebec. Um, what else you see in front of you, you see, uh, if you can see my screen, uh, we organized a protest in front, in front of Hydro-Quebec headquarters in Montreal. Um, so anyways, we, we did a lot of work with, with, uh, with partners. Uh, we, we actually formed an alliance uh, it was called Muteheko Hippo Alliance. Uh, Muteheko Hippo is the, the Inu name of the river. So our, uh, our first partners are the uh, Inu First Nation, uh, the, especially the, the community of Ekwanichit. Um, the river is on their Nitasinan, which is the, the, the name of the ancestral land of the Inu. Um, we also 
in this alliance, we have a group of municipalities uh, from a region called Mangani. Um, uh, the official structure of the municipalities is a, it's called a regional um, county municipality. It's a group of uh, about 11 municipalities who uh, are, you know, uh, in a territory as big as, as Ireland. So it's pretty big. And there's us, and there's this group of paddlers that I mentioned. So uh, our goal, uh, well, at the start, our goal was to have a, a protected area, a typical protected area created by the Quebec government or under the Quebec government laws. Uh, we do have a law in Quebec that's called um, La Loi sur la Conservation du Patrimoine, the law on the, the act on, con uh, not sure how to translate that, the conservation of, of, of uh, heritage, natural heritage. Um, so, so through time, we found out that Hydro-Quebec was probably too powerful for us. Uh, they, they actually have a, almost a veto on any protected area project in Quebec. Uh, and we found out that Hydro-Quebec would not uh, let the Quebec government create a, a permanent and legal protected area on the Magpie River. Um, so back in around 2018, we started the, well, we were starting to see this rights of nature movement across the world, uh, cases uh, uh, such as the Atrato River in Colombia, the Supreme Court of Colombia, you know, uh, designating the Atrato River as a legal person. Same thing in New Zealand with the Wanganui River, uh, a treaty between uh, the New Zealand government and the Maori First Nation uh, to grant uh, the Wanganui River, uh, again, a legal personhood status and different cases in India, et cetera. And we started thinking, um, could that happen in Quebec? And we, uh, we had a talk with the um, International Observatory on Nature's Right, who is actually based in Montreal. And we had a very interesting conversation about, yeah, about, you know, could something be, be done in Quebec? And we, we analyzed a few places, a few rivers, and we quickly, we, we found out that the Magpie River was a perfect case uh, because of, well, mainly two or three reasons. The first one being the link between the people, the Innu uh, and, and the river. Uh, the Innu had, had been using the river for uh, millennials. Um, and, and, um, and also that the people who, who live there, the people from Magani have a very important link with the river as well. So that, that's very important. Uh, the Magpie River was also located in one, only one jurisdiction. Uh, so some rivers are located between different countries that's, or provinces that's, that's more complicated. It's not the case of the Magpie River. Uh, and a few other, I mean, I mean, the international recognition of the river also was an important component. So we, we the lawyers with who that we worked really thought it would be a good first case for Quebec. Um, so, um, so uh, yeah, so, so again, I'm gonna make a long story short here, but in, 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 in the three years between uh, 2018 and 2021, uh, we did, you know, all the, the, the behind the scenes work, uh, we, uh, we sat down with the lawyers, uh, we thought about, you know, what, what could be the mechanism that could be used because in, in the rights of nature movement, you have different mechanisms. Uh, I mentioned the Atrato River, uh, which is a judgment from a Supreme Court. Uh, in, in New Zealand, uh, the mechanism that was used is a treaty between, uh, between different nations. Uh, and in our case, we used a mechanism that is more common in the US and the United States, which is uh, resolutions. In the United States, uh, you have a lot of municipalities who have declared the rights of nature through municipal resolutions. But what's unique with what we have done is that we actually had a twin resolutions that have been um, voted from, uh, by um, a First Nation Council and municipalities. And I, I'm saying twin resolutions, but they're not identical twins. Uh, they're, they're somewhat different because the, the legal foundations are different because the resolution from the Innu First Nation is based on, on indigenous, indigenous rights, uh, international law, et cetera. Uh, while the, the resolution from municipalities is based on the, well, the competencies of the municipalities in, in, in the Quebec law. So um, I, uh, Tina is going to speak up about the resolutions more in detail, but uh, that's that's what's unique with our 
or initiative is that we we and that's what actually in my opinion and uh, I think that's actually what makes it more powerful because in in the U.S. a lot of municipal resolutions were actually uh, overruled by uh, if we can say so higher authorities such as the states or federal government so that's one of the weaknesses but uh, of this kind of mechanism but uh, I think, uh, and if you look at the resolutions in details, I mean, they're 15 pages, uh, they have a lot of legal foundations. So uh, it's, it's not been written on the corner of a table. Uh, it took three years actually to get there. Um, so we were really happy in February to make the official announcement. The resolutions were voted. Uh, we got uh, international coverage. Uh, we sent press releases uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, I'm giving webinars like this to uh, in a lot of places, and I'm, I'm I'm really happy that people are interested in this uh, because actually for us it was uh, somewhat a way it, it was somewhat an alternative to this uh, you know uh, classic uh, protected area. Uh, it it was a way for us to to do something from the bottom up, really. Uh, that and that's what's important. And it doesn't, it's not in contradiction. I mean, tomorrow the Quebec government could create a protected area on the Magpie River and would be really happy about that. And we're still pursuing the work uh, to have it recognized uh, under such a status. But um, I think the, you know, the paradigm shift is, is, is really important uh, with the rights of nature movement because uh, you can build something from, you know, with the tools that we have. That's really what we wanted to do actually, build, protect the river with the tools that we we actually have, uh, uh, so I'm saying we uh, with the alliance, of, of course, as a, an an NGO, CPAOS doesn't have much powers or rights, but uh, the Ben Council, the First Nation, do have a lot of, of rights, and the municipalities uh, have a lot of, of powers too. So. Um, um, so yeah, that was an alternate way for us to, to have the river protected. And um, I mean, you have a, a, a picture here of the French resolutions just to get an idea of what it looks like. But the, um, the, the content of the resolutions uh, is, is, is divided into five parts. Uh, the first one is, it talks about the river itself, the Muteheko Kohipu. Uh, the second part talks about the link between the river and uh, both the Inu and um, the municipalities, the people of Mangani. Um, the third part talks about uh, the international movement, uh, about the recognition of rights of nature. Uh, the fourth part is different uh, for, for each resolution. It's actually the legal foundations um, of the resolutions. And uh, the last part is actually the, yeah, the operative part where the nine rights of the river are declared and uh, other things uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, the guardians, the nomination of guardians, uh, the responsibilities of those guardians, because um, in our legal system, uh, a river cannot speak for itself, so it needs guardians. So that's, that's actually our next step. Um, it's, to, uh, it's to have the, the guardians nominated by uh, the resolutions all uh, actually, um, the resolutions calls for the guardians to be nominated jointly by the Inu uh, Ben Council of Ekwanichit and uh, the um, Regional County Municipality of Mangani. So it's going to be a joint uh, nomination. So we're working on uh, some some kind of agreement between the two entities to have the guardians nominated and probably have a ceremony too. Um, so this is really our next step. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to pursue the work to have the, the river declared as a protected area. Um, I think a, a double status is, is not uh, going to cause a harm. It's going to be uh, better. So, um, so that's our next step. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there because I want to leave space for a dialogue, for questions. But that's, uh, that's in short our, our story. Um, so I hope it's, uh, it, it's inspiring. And uh, I'm going to send over the mic to Gregory. Oh, Pierre Olivier, thank you so much, and th thank you for the slides. That, that was that, that was helpful for me to follow that because it's it, it's intricate, it's time consuming. I was fascinated with the idea that you started to work on, I suppose, the narrative, the legal dialogue before you chose a river, and uh, and and I think that uh, 
there's a lot of merit in that. Um, so th thank you so much. And I know there'll be questions here to get back to you uh, and certainly be questions back to Albert as well. But, but Tina, this, the, the legal intricacies from your point of view, both as a, as a, a lawyer and as an educator, uh, I, I'd like your observations. Sure, thanks. And, and let me start by saying thank you to Pierre Olivier for that presentation and, and also for all the, the beautiful pictures. I mean, it was, it was really nice to have those because in reading about those resolutions, um, you know, in the spring is, or I guess the winter and the spring is the, the news is breaking. I don't, I don't know that all the pictures in the news media were as beautiful as some of those. So thanks for those. And, and thank you also to Elder Albert for your comments earlier. Um, so, so as Gregory says, I mean, I think I'm going to try to um, maybe just respond a little bit and then maybe, maybe fill out a little bit um, of the legal context that that is behind some of what Pierre Olivier was was speaking about in terms of you know his take on the the on the ground experience of of um, working towards those resolutions and talking a little bit about what um, what maybe we need to think about if we're thinking about using this kind of mechanism elsewhere and particularly if anybody was thinking about wanting to use these kind of mechanisms in in Atlantic Canada so. Um, I want to preface my comments with, with a couple of remarks first. Um, one, I want to say that my comments are going to be really high level when I talk about the, the legal intricacies, as, as I think Gregory mentioned, and because there are quite a lot of complexities when you think about using uh, mechanisms like this, resolutions, whether from a municipality or from an Indigenous government. Um, a lot of complexity. So, so necessarily, I'm just going to kind of skim along the surface for a little bit and, and try to keep these comments fairly brief as well. And the other thing I'll say, um, just in case it's not absolutely clear, uh, is that, you know, I'm coming at this from the perspective of an interested observer, uh, who in no way was was involved, um, and, and can't in any way speak with experience or, or, um, or kind of personal anecdote as to, to the development of these resolutions in Quebec. Uh, so looking at it as somebody based here in Nova Scotia, who, um, which is very interested in, in wanting to think more about them. And also coming to this as, as a settler person here in Mi'kmaq as well. So coming at these issues, some of which do call up uh, really complex and, and really vital indigenous rights issues. So when I speak to those issues, I'm speaking as a settler. So just wanted to make sure that's clear as well. Um, so a couple of things, I think, just to, to lay the groundwork, just want to reiterate comments that Pierre Olivier made about the fact that legal recognition for rights of nature can happen in a number of ways. There are a number of instruments and some of the examples that he gave were court decisions, treaties, written laws by governments. And in fact, the, the resolutions from Quebec, the resolutions from the, the Mingani Regional County Municipality and the Inu Council of Iguanichi. I mean, though the resolutions themselves also point to examples elsewhere. They point to um, national laws, so laws created by national governments like the Government of Canada. They point to subnational laws, like laws that would be created by states that are part of larger federal nations or here in Canada, theoretically provinces or territories, although we don't have those examples here. Um, and then also laws created by, uh, by municipalities and indigenous governments as well. So um, quite a lot of range in terms of thinking about the governing body that could enact these kinds of laws. And then of course, there's the potential for laws to be recognized through the courts as well. And, um, and here in Canada, we would think about that as being recognition at common law with common law being the, the law that develops through generations of decision-making by courts. And I won't really speak to that very much because I think Sarah is going to touch on that topic mainly. But I will say, just to provide some, some initial context for this discussion about trying to recognize rights of nature in, in laws created by governments, that, um, that there are advantages to doing that, particularly in a legal system like Canada's. And, and one big advantage is that when, when judges working in the common law tradition, and, and certainly in Canada, when judges are working in that tradition and thinking about the, the growth of the evolution of the common law, they work very hard to make sure that that growth happens in a way that, that they phrase as being incremental. That is, that is the goal. As the common law evolves to match social evolution, 
uh, the courts want to see that evolution happening incrementally. So if we think back to the quote from David Boyd that Gregory started us off with, this necessity for a massive transformation in the law. And if we think to the language used in the, re the resolutions coming out of Quebec, you know, a paradigm shift. And um, in that phrase, uh, Pierre Olivier picked it up in his PowerPoint as well. Um, massive transformations of law and kind of wholesale paradigm shifts are, are things that courts are very hesitant about uh, and um, triggering on their own. They want to see that kind of thing coming from government. So when it comes to thinking about legal rights of nature, I mean, really we're thinking about a legal system here in Canada for us that for, for centuries, really, when you think about the, the long, long history of our legal system, our legal system is one in which for a very, very long time, um, the, the personal property rights of individuals or of, of the crown or you know, the crown's kind of government representatives, property rights have been uh, enormously prioritized in our legal system. And, and nature itself and all of the other than human species that inhabit this planet with us, I mean, those have typically been considered property or things that are uh, able to be conceived of as property. And so when we think about the, the law as we have historically understood it, things other than humans, and, and frankly, historically at times, uh, you know, even humans have been conceived of as, as property and the law has evolved in ways um, that have thankfully taken us away from much of that. Um, but with nature, we still fundamentally think about it as property that is ownable by people. So when we're thinking then about recognizing legally nature's rights, uh, nature having rights that are separate and apart from whatever, uh, whatever might be associated with, with our rights to own it, that is a pretty transformative shift. That is a paradigm shift. And so when we're thinking then about the role of governments in making those changes, the benefit of government action is that governments have more liberty um, or they're, they can be more willing to exercise that liberty uh, to, to make radical change in the laws that they create. Um, so, so that's a benefit of having governments enact these laws. And when it comes to the local government perspective, uh, so a municipality, a settler municipality within the Canadian legal system or, um, or an indigenous governance body, which, which might not necessarily be, be a local government. So I think uh, just to make things clear and, and make them a little bit less complex uh, this evening, I'll maybe talk specifically about ban councils because the, the Inu Council of Egwanichi that, that passed this resolution is a ban council as, um, as recognized under Canada's Indian Act. And so that's a specific kind of indigenous governance body uh, that would be different from other indigenous governance bodies that could also be, um, be uh, giving life to these laws. When we're thinking about these kinds of, of governments, um, there are pros and cons, and, and Pierre Olivier spoke to some of the pros, and I think implicit in some of what he was saying um, are things like, you know, if, if we see that uh, a higher level of government or, or an altogether different level of government, so with municipalities, often the provincial and federal governments are, are talked about as the senior levels of government, and with Indigenous governments, we think about them as different different kinds of governments altogether. Although in Canada's legal system, uh, the courts do tend to see ban councils as being um, sort of legally subordinate to the federal government because they're constituted under federal legislation. So when we think about the interplay, if, if the levels of government that are kind of higher up in the Canadian legal order as, as the courts and Canadian governments understand them, if they're not taking the actions, um, local governments can can be motivated to act and can want to act to, uh, to, to put in place protections that, um, that are gonna protect places and ecologies that really matter to the people who live in those places. There's that, that sense of well, we're the ones who live here, this is important to us, we're the people that are connected to these places and, and the governments that represent us most directly, um, we, should, we should be taking action and, and we ought to be able to exercise that power. Uh, so that's an important aspect of it, that kind of directness of the contact. But then there are, there are some cons that come with that, and, and Pierre Olivier alluded to this as well. And, and cons are the reality that, that in Canada's legal system, I mean, municipalities are common, commonly called creatures of statute by Canada's courts and, and by governments. And, and that's because they are 
constituted by statutes that are enacted by provincial governments. So constitutionally in Canada, municipalities exercise powers that constitutionally belong to the provinces, which the provinces then delegate to, to local governments through legislation. And what that means is that municipalities are only really empowered to, to do what the provinces have said they can do. So if you think about there being kind of pot of provincial power and the provinces give some of that power to municipalities but reserve other bits of it for themselves, municipalities are not supposed to encroach on what the provinces have reserved for themselves. And this can create conflicts when you see municipalities um, taking action to protect nature that that the provinces then see to be stepping outside of the power that's been given to them. You run, you can run into similar problems when it comes to, um, when it comes to ban councils uh, as well, ban councils constituted um, primarily under Canada's federal Indian Act and then also can be given and, and often argument additional powers under other pieces of federal legislation. The, the context though there is, is different in many, many ways and, and Pierre Olivier alluded to this. Um, and it's because in addition to being governments that are created by a federal statute and, and also empowered under other federal statutes as well, band councils may also exercise and claim the, the rights that, um, that their community members claim uh, as, as constantly constitutionally protected Aboriginal and treaty rights in Canada, and in addition, additional Indigenous rights that maybe have not yet been recognized by Canada's course, but that are increasingly being recognized internationally through, um, through the, the growth and the emergence of customary international law, much of which has been uh, attempted to be articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples. And so when we're thinking then about um, about analogies between municipal government resolutions and band council resolutions, particularly resolutions of this kind, which are trying to do something really quite transformative and quite different. Um, you know, there, there are really interesting intersections and complexities at play because a municipality may run up against a province saying, well, no, you don't have any power under Quebec's legislation, for example, to do what it is you're saying that you're doing because you can't infringe on what we reserve for ourselves. The band council could theoretically run up against that, but the government's arguments would, and it would be the federal government, uh, potentially also the provincial too, but the provincial would have uh, a little bit less power to make these kinds of arguments. Um, but the council doesn't just have to rely on what has been uh, given to it in, in Canadian legislation. There's this whole other sphere of, of power and rights that come from the, the communal rights of, of the people, the inherent indigenous rights of the people that the council represents. And so, so there's there a whole additional realm of possibility. And, and I'm not, I don't wanna give the impression that it's then uh, necessarily uh, an easy victory there. It's not because the, the Canadian legal system and the ways in which Canada's courts have developed uh, jurisprudence, so decisions that deal with the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights and Indigenous rights more broadly. I mean, those decisions, um, it, it's very, very difficult actually to, to recognize, to have rights recognized by the courts. So, so I'm not saying that it's, it makes it a whole lot easier to assert those rights and then get the recognition, but it's certainly an aspect that is there and it's available and, um, and it can be it can be used, I think, for good. So what's so interesting about these resolutions, as Pierre Olivier was saying, is that the municipalities resolution really does point to the powers that municipalities have within Quebec's provincial laws, not only the primary laws that enable municipalities, but then other legislation in Quebec that, that is part of Quebec's kind of really interesting legislative scheme when it comes to Quebec's environmental laws. I mean, Quebec, unlike most other Canadian provinces, uh, in fact, yeah, all of the Canadian provinces, but one has, has environmental rights legislated. And so that's a different piece of the puzzle there that, that the, the municipality resolution also sort of points to as part of the context that's informing it. Um, and then the Indu Council's resolution, you know, it does, point to assertions of Aboriginal title, assertions of Aboriginal harvesting rights, 
points to the fact that the council is currently in the middle of a comprehensive, or not the middle, but in the midst of a the negotiations for a comprehensive land claim agreement. So a modern treaty under which other rights might be recognized. The, the, um, the community has claimed rights over quite a large portion of their traditional territory, including the river. So all of that gets, um, gets brought in. Additionally, assertions of the rights to practice traditional laws and legal orders, which recognize the river very differently than it's recognized in Canada's colonial laws. That there's that aspect as well that comes in. So there really is an attempt to pull to the forefront um, indigenous laws and legal orders and the, the capacity to exercise those in ways that are different from, um, from just a simple kind of conception of banned governments being empowered just by uh, just by Canada's legal system. So, so there's a huge amount going on there that's, that's really, really interesting um, and I think really powerful. So, um, so I think maybe, I mean, I think I might just leave it there in terms of talking a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes and maybe more, uh, I can speak a little bit more if questions are asked about particulars. Um, but just wanted to give a little bit of sense there about some of the, the analogies that, that come into play, uh, but then also some, some really important differences that then create, I think, a whole wealth of possibilities, but also potentially um, some, really interesting, um, some really interesting kind of sticky points of contention, depending on how things go. And, and actually, sorry, I will say one more thing uh, before closing, which is that if you think about the resolutions with all of this in mind and like against the background of thinking what, what powers can each of us as governance bodies assert and, and then think might have a fighting chance if we come up against a challenge by the province or the federal court or corporation or whomever else. If you think about the resolutions against that background, I think it becomes a little bit easier to understand why it is that they do what they do. So when you look at the resolutions, they don't, they don't attempt to ban certain practices. They don't come right out and say hydro will never happen on the river. They assert the rights of the river. They establish this, um, this conception of the guardians. They establish what each government intends to do as when it comes to kind of asserting the values and the perspective it plans to take when protecting the river. They position the guardians as guardians that will engage in um, consultation processes that might happen about future developments. So they're setting up a whole framework of this is how we're going to defend the river rather than attempting in law to ban outright things that might happen, which would have been something that could have very easily, I think, triggered a quick challenge um, right away. And, and this is a way, I think, to come at it a little bit kind of around the side in a way that might not immediately appear so threatening, but could potentially be really, really valuable, I think. So, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Tina, thank you. I mean, um, I, I thought that was brilliant in the sense that, that, that you went through the legal complexities and I understood it. And, uh, um, and you raised, and, I, and I'll t turn past the talking stick to Sarah here in just a second, but the thing I'd like to return to at the end of it, you, you, you highlighted this conundrum that I've been dealing with for 25 years when it comes to climate change, and I think Albert pointed to it as well, is there the, um, the it's the incremental change that the law likes. It's the incremental change that local government likes. And it's the incremental change that larger nation state governments like. The problem with climate change, it takes bold action. So I'm always trying to, um, I decided to serve as a municipal counselor just to test those waters so that I could, and you're absolutely right on the limitations. As a municipal counselor, I only had those, my, my latitude was dictated in a sense by the province. But, uh, and, and so I'm trying to, I've always tried to figure out how do you get the bold action out there? Two ways that I think you do it. Either business does it or NGOs do it. Because my, my idea as an old grant writer was nonprofits are brilliant because they can do things that no one else can do. 
They, they can shape visions without these constraints. So uh, that, that's, I suppose that's may, my way of saying, I'm always looking for that mechanism to get the bold solutions out there. So you were very helpful. Sarah, what's your take? Thanks, Gregory, and, and thanks to everyone who's who's spoken already tonight. It's been it's been really wonderful, and I'm flattered to uh, to be included in the conversation. Um, I, I'm Sarah. By way of introduction, I, I work as a staff lawyer with Eco Justice, as Gregory said. I've been working with Eco Justice for a number of years now, um, and basically since I started, we've been having this conversation about um, rights of nature and what we can do as an organization to um, to move rights of nature forward in Canada. Um, we've been primarily looking at it from a litigation perspective, trying to figure out what is the most strategic way to bring litigation forward that would um, establish at least some basic procedural rights for natural entities, uh, most likely an animal species in Canada to start with at the very least. Um, I mean, Tina went through uh, in a lot of really helpful detail um, the mechanisms that have been used by municipalities, indigenous governing, governing bodies, et cetera, um, to establish these you know, fairly um, radical transformative visions uh, for, for rights of, of nature, for various ecosystems, various natural entities. Um, and I, I certainly agree that it's most likely that those sorts of substantive rights, at least right now, um, would be established by way of instruments like that. Um, because as Tina said, the courts do take a very incremental approach to the development of the law in most cases. Um, but one, one avenue that we think we at Ecojustice and, and myself included think um, might be promising to approach via litigation is um, establishing what's called standing um, for most likely, uh, as I said, an animal species, uh, perhaps something like a river or an ecosystem or something like that. Um, we think that there is at least an argument to be made um, that a species should have standing to go to court and to be able to um, ask for a remedy to address harm done to, to that species or natural thing. Um, so as, as Tina already covered, um, our Canadian legal system treats non-human species and natural areas as, as human property. And this of course includes in the context of litigation. Um, and this, you know, this is premised on the overarching concept that human beings are separate from and superior to the rest of the natural world. That's sort of the premise of, of our legal system. Um, and the practical result of that is that humans and their institutions can bring litigation seeking compensation for harm to their property um, or to otherwise enforce their property rights when harm is done to their land or their pets, uh, that sort of thing. But the natural world has no right to bring litigation in its own name um, and harm done to the natural world has no legal value in the context of litigation um, outside of its impacts on property rights or possibly in the odd case impacts on human health. Um, so in the, in the context of litigation, um, standing is standing meaning the right to go to court to bring legal action in your own name to ask the court to address harm done to you um, is generally available only to legal persons, which in our legal system includes individual humans and human constructs like corporate bodies, but not animals or other natural entities. Um, but the advocacy for um, establishing legal standing for animals or other natural systems um, has 
been around for, you know, 50 years at this point. It, uh, to my knowledge, started back in the 1970s, at least from a, from a Western perspective, but I'm sure that uh, others have been calling it for it for much longer. Um, but back in the 1970s, an American legal scholar by the name of Christopher Stone called for three core legal rights to be granted to natural entities. Um, the first being that the natural entity must be able to institute actions at its behest, so on its own initiative, uh, in its own name, and that is sort of the, the basic concept of standing. The second being that in determining the granting of legal relief, the court must take injury to the natural thing into account. So the court must not only look at that the harm done to a, a human being's property rights, um, but must actually look at the damage done to the ecosystem, to the animal itself, and, and weigh that, uh, you know, give that its own value. Um, and third, the legal relief granted by the court must run to the benefit of the, the species, the ecosystem. Um, so it must actually contribute to, you know, remediating harm done to the ecosystem, um, protecting it from future harm, that sort of thing, rather than simply trying to compensate a human individual for, you know, loss of value to their property or what have you. Um, so we've already heard a number of examples of, of um, legal personhood being granted to a natural entity. The Magpie River uh, declarations certainly include um, a statement saying that the, that the river may now bring legal action, um, which, is, which is fantastic. Uh, and other declarations have, have done similar things. Um, but another route to achieve that end that has been tried around the world with, with varying levels of success is litigation to establish legal standing. Um, and uh, although there has not yet been any litigation of this kind in, in Canada, to my knowledge, either successful or unsuccessful, and um, all the US litigation that I'm aware of so far has unfortunately been unsuccessful, there have been successful examples from elsewhere in the world, uh, very much rooted in, in the legal systems in those particular countries. Um, so just as a, as a fun example, in Argentina, in 2016, a court declared a chimpanzee named Cecilia to be a legal person with corresponding rights and ordered that she be transferred out of the zoo where she was living in you know, uh, relatively poor conditions and, and ordered her to be transferred to a sanctuary. Um, 2017, a court in India declared a number of rivers, including the Ganges River, to be legal persons. Although unfortunately that ruling was later overturned and I understand is still going through some complicated legal proceedings, still under appeal. Uh, so we'll see how that ends up. Um, and then most recently in 2018, the Colombian Supreme Court re recognized the Colombian Amazon as the subject of rights and declared that it was entitled to protection and conservation, restoration, et cetera. Um, so as I said, these court decisions are all based heavily in the domestic legal regimes of those individual countries. Um, so unfortunately not directly applicable to Canada. We, we can't go to a Canadian court and say the Colombian Supreme Court did this, so you should do it too. Um, although I, I think from an optimistic perspective that they are certainly illustrative of sort of shifting perceptions of the natural world among judiciaries around the world um, that will you know, hopefully make their way to Canada. Um, more relevant to, the, to our legal system in Canada is um, litigation in the US. Um, and, and down there, there's an organization called the Non-Human Rights Project that um, has brought numerous cases forward on behalf of, of various animals held in captivity, seeking to establish that those animals are legal persons and that they have the right to be free from arbitrary detention. Um, so this group has been amazingly busy and they've brought so much litigation. Um, generally on behalf of elephants and great apes held in, in less than ideal conditions. Um, 
Unfortunately, they haven't been successful in, in this litigation thus far, uh, but they they continue fighting um, and they have gotten some, even, even in their losses, they have gotten some pretty powerful language out of judges saying, you know, we wish that we could rule with you because we agree that these are amazing animals with, with you know, high levels of emotional intelligence, uh, cognitive abilities, that sort of thing. But, but unfortunately the precedent uh, binds us to, to find against you. Um, so we'll see how that progresses, but I think that um, the fight down there is certainly admirable. Um, and as I said before, I'm not aware of any current or past litigation in Canada that has directly attempted to establish legal standing or personhood for an animal or other natural entity. Although this is definitely something that we at EcoJustice are actively considering and we continue brainstorming um, different ways of, of moving this forward um, in a manner that we think has the highest chance of success. Um, so I can, you know, if there are questions about, about various avenues, I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer them afterwards. I would just like to quickly highlight a couple of, of relatively recent cases in Canada, which in which judges, although they have still found that, that animals are personal property and that, you know, they have to rule um, in accordance with that precedent, um, judges have still emphasized the, the complex cognitive and emotional needs of animals, um, which does suggest to me that the Canadian judiciary may be sort of slowly shifting towards becoming more open to the idea of rights, at least for non-human animal species. Um, so just super quick, uh, the first case I'd highlight is a 2011 case out of the Alberta Court of Appeal about an elephant named Lucy. Um, and the second is a 2018 case out of the Newfoundland and Labrador Court of Appeal about a dog named Maya. Um, and in both cases, um, the court, the majority of the court ruled rather conservatively, but an individual judge in both cases dissented from the majority and made quite powerful statements suggesting that um, although animals are personal property, they should not be treated as property in the same way as, you know, an inan inanimate object or money or something of that nature. So there is this, this slight shift that we're seeing. And I admittedly, these are baby steps. Um, but in my view, they are positive indicators of the direction that Canadian courts are heading when it comes to the consideration of issues affecting non-human species. And in combination with some of the more progressive environmental judgments that we've started to see, including the uh, most recent judgment of the Nova Scotia Supreme Court on the Endangered Species Act here, um, I think that we can have some optimism that this is a, a positive harbinger of, of things to come. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there, subject to questions. Great. Sarah, thank you. you, you. I lit up on one thing that, that you said, I, and it makes me I'll probably show my age, but a long time ago, the first philosophy class I had, I signed up for the philosophy class. It was on the, um, I, I think, the philosophy of social policy, and it was directed to the bookstore. I went down to the bookstore to get the, the two books for the class. One was uh, uh, Plato's Republic, and the other was Christopher Stone's work. And uh, the whole seminar was looking at those, and it's interesting that they all dealt with what we started with, the first question, transfer, tra if we're gonna make the change transformation uh, of law, education, economics, philosophy, religion, culture, we went through all of that. But the thing that after hearing you, you, you bring up Christopher's work that I recall is Christopher and I think David Boyd is saying uh, that the most important piece, the way the world is structured right now is to change the legal piece. And I, I've been fascinated with, with that ever since. And then when the Center for Local Prosperity did our first uh, conference on climate change, and I believe uh, Albert was, was there to, to speak, and he really brought up this treaty law. 
And all of a sudden that started to make sense to the Center for Local Prosperity, that that's some vehicle for change that we should not ignore. And we've never really, never really dropped that. But the idea that the, if we can change the legal piece, a lot of this other stuff will fall in place. So I just, and I think that was one of the reasons that the center really looked at legal rights for nature and litigation to just see how earnest that work can be um, and yet how difficult it, it needs to be. So, th so that's my comments for now. Did any other, the, the, the uh, Albert, you've got your hand up, please. First Thank of you. all, I think I have to apologize. With my grade three mainstream education, I wouldn't be doing a lot of stumbling here. But I want to try to uh, give it from a, from a layman's perspective and from, from my three to eight perspective. I know across this country, there has been a lot of court cases. And each court case, I believe, reaffirmed that we still have treaty and Aboriginal rights. And also, I believe it highlighted the fact that legally, constitutionally, we have a special relationship to the land, to our treaty, treaty, and, treaty and Aboriginal rights. To, to engage or to employ the concept of our law, in which at any point that we feel that this, that this decision here will impede or compromise the very existence of our life, that we should have a legal recourse. Because each and every case that, I know, that I've heard is that the judge kept reiterating, this is a communal and a collective right. And to touch upon some of the Tina's points about chief and council, again from a layman's from a layman's perspective, that is very that is very problematic for us because we see the chief and council has been in a conflict in conflict in position in which we can easily refer to them. They are actually the agents of the crown. So I think, therefore, they are in a very much in a conflicting position. Now, to put something into perspective, I would like to uh, ask if, since Canada has ratified that in, uh, international rights of indigenous people, and one of the articles talks about free, prior, and informed consent. And how we understand those three terms is that free, it has to be free from duress, free from anyone being offered special favors prior. And before any informed decision can be made, you have to ensure that it will not impede or compromise our treaty and Aboriginal rights. And, and if at any time we feel that there was a decision made that's contrary to, the, to our, to our, to our, to our um, Aboriginal knowledges and rights in which nature cannot be compromised, we should be granted a right of seeking independent assessment, contrary to what the um, what the corporate science has put out on behalf of the government and on behalf of industry. Now, with that, then I believe we should have a prerogative of seeking a legal recourse in which. Based on, based on those past decisions that our, our Aboriginal treaty rights should also have a veto power in which at any time we feel that this project will compromise the integrity of our, of our area 
in which we compromise our wellness, our well-being, and, 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 and our way of life. So can we use the, any can we use that article in that international rights of indigenous people where we talk about uh, free, free prior informed consent? And now the other question about informed consent is we have to come to some understanding. Who can actually give give an informed consent? Again, I would question from my from my from my, from my Aboriginal layman's lens that it cannot and should not be the, the chief and council, because to me they are in a conflicting conflicting position, since they are the agents of the crown. And then do we have a legal recourse? Since our treaties are pre-confederation, could they be recognized as, as having international status? Because I, ca I can't help but recall when the United States and Canada were fighting over Georgia's banks. Neither, of, ne neither country was, was, had confidence with the, with the Canadian legal system, and the Canadian system did not have confidence with the American system. So they took it into international courts. So these are the things I believe that, um, in my humble opinion, we have to um, find a way in which exactly how, what rights do we have in protecting our source of life? I don't think that, 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 that question has never been asked or that privilege was never extended. Now, how can we, using the current legal system, I don't think we have a chance because in this legal system here, for example, I can't help but remember when there was a dispute down at, at uh, Digby there this past year. So the, the court was con reconvened and reconvened and they came up with this term, modern livelihood. Now, to me, I have to admit, I'm not, a, I'm lost at this uh, mainstream language, but to me, that modern livelihood is it is an illusion fostered by the government, implemented by the FO, to legally deny us access to that, to that particular gift or resource of fishery. And every one of those courts, every one of those fancy words like food and ceremonial, again, to me, it's an illusion. How can you use any of those of guaranteeing anyone to live off the land the way in which they know of without compromising the integrity of it? So these are my, as I said, I, I do apologize. I'm really stumbling into with, with the English language. But I do hope that you might be able to get this just just a little bit just of it what I'm trying to what I'm trying to ask, what I'm trying to say, that in order for us to achieve our overall objective in which our treaty, treaty and Aboriginal rights will have a, a veto right in, in terms if someone is, is, is going to compromise our very source of life and, and a source of life for the future. So, so again, I thank you for, for allowing me to um, make a point even though I'm, I'm having, I'm stumbling all over the place because I, with my grade three education, English language is such a diverse language. Whereas if I could have asked those questions in your language, in my language, and you, you, you have a privilege to put those things on your ear and somebody would do the, the proper translation for me, that would be fitting to the education that you, that, you, that you people have, lawyers especially. And I, with that, I thank you very much for listening to me. Okay. Albert, thank, br brilliant questions. And, uh, and I don't know who wants to take that because I think Pierre Olivier, Sarah and Tina, I think you may all have something to, to say on that, but in, it's an excellent question. And, and, and to roll in one of the questions from the participants uh, on, online here, that also hinges, one of his questions is, how do you use this language, these concepts, to motivate both the wealthy 
and and the the, the, the politicians to start crafting their, their lives around this new vision that that uh, Albert laid out and is, and is struggling with. So if someone could, could answer that, that would be delightful. I'm happy to take, oh, sorry, Pierre Olivier, did you wanna go? I was happy. I, I was happy to take a run at some of your your comments, Albert. I'm not sure if I'll be able to fold in that last bit, Gregory. But if if that sparks something for Pierre Olivier, then maybe I'll leave that for him. Um, first, I'll say, Albert. I mean, there's really no need to apologize. Uh, I think the questions you were asking were really um, they're really important questions and they're profound ones. And I find myself asking the same questions often and, and going around in circles with them. So um, and and what you meant came through very clearly. I think, I mean, I think you asked a number of questions, but but they kind of, you know, they come together to form, I think, a couple of big themes and 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 so I'll maybe just condense so the response isn't too long. I mean, it seems to me that part of what you're asking is about Canada's existing legal system, can it really as it stands now, there are clearly so many problems with it. Can it really be fixed? And maybe can the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, can that be some kind of lever, some kind of tool that, that helps us to, to fix? And, and as you're pointing out, I mean, the, there's a problem with the way Canada's courts recognize Aboriginal and treaty rights under the constitution. So Aboriginal and treaty rights are protected just, and this isn't for you, I, I know you know this, but it's for others on the line that might, that might be listening and not know this, but they're protected under section 35 of the constitution, but it doesn't really explain what they are. So Canada's courts were given the responsibility to define what they were gonna to consider to be Aboriginal and treaty rights and using those, those terms for the purposes of the constitution. And when Canada's courts decided what frameworks and interpretations they were going to use to, to recognize what was going to be a protected Aboriginal right and what was going to be a protected treaty right, they came up with quite specific frameworks to, to interpret those terms. And the frameworks really, they, they break things down and they, they kind of parcel them down into very specific little nuggets of rights. So, um, you know, Canada's courts have, re have recognized Mi'kmaq rights to, to fish, Mi'kmaq Aboriginal fishing rights for food, social, ceremonial purposes, as you've said. They've also recognized a treaty right to fish commercially. They've defined it, as you said, as a, as a moderate livelihood, right? And those are all court interpretations that really define those rights very specifically. And the way that the courts have defined how those rights intersect with the federal or the provincial government's rights is that, that the rights need to be honored, but the court also says that the governments can, can violate those rights in certain circumstances as well. So they're not, they're not, they're not rights that have absolute protections. They're not, um, they're not, um, I guess they, they are vulnerable still to, to violation or what, what the courts call infringement by, by the government in very specific circumstances. But those circumstances, even if the courts imagine them are, are really quite broad. So, so there's that problem, the rights that are protected aren't protected entirely. And, and courts, you're right, you're absolutely right that the court decisions that we have on those rights and on Mi'kmaq rights in particular they do imply that, that there ought to be, you know, when there's a right to fish or harvest, that there ought to be a corresponding right for the community that holds the right to be able to, to regulate or to decide how, how community members are going to be able to access. So there's this kind of suggestion that communities ought to be able to, to govern their own use of the resource in question um, and then there's this suggestion that then that maybe that's a space where the traditional laws of the community, the traditional governance of the community should be in play and should be honored by the courts. But at the same time, in a different history of, of decisions by, by the courts and by the Supreme Court of Canada in particular, the way that our courts approach the question of, of Indigenous governance rights, like Indigenous rights to, Indigenous communities rights to govern themselves, 
they also parcel those rights down into very specific little nuggets. So our courts, Canada's courts don't recognize a, a broad sort of sweeping right to, for a community to, to govern itself or for an indigenous nation to govern itself as, as a whole. They say, well, if you're asserting a, a right to govern, you have to prove that you have a right to govern this specific element of your practice. So if you want to govern fisheries or you want to govern, I mean, our most famous case on this is a gambling case. If you want to govern gambling uh, in your community, you have to prove that you historically as a community used to govern gambling or fishing or whatever. So it's a very, like the system is very, um, they sort of chop up the rights in the system and that makes it difficult then to, to establish a whole and to establish a kind of entire right to say no to something or to say we ought to be able to make decisions about what happens to the resources we depend upon for our lives. So, so it's a big problem in our system. And the way in which UNDRIP, the, the declaration can help, I think it has a big power to help, but, but right now, Canada in implementing UNDRIP is, is not recognizing that free prior informed consent means that they always need to get consent. The government of Canada is saying that the, really what that means in most cases is that the government needs to work meaningfully to, to try to get consent, but that when, they, when it comes down to it, they don't necessarily need to get it. So that's the interpretation the government is, of Canada is taking in most cases. Um, so, so there's still a long way to go. UNDRIP on its own, I think, isn't gonna fix the problems until we see enough of a political shift to, and, and enough of a demand by, frankly, by settler Canadians saying, um, you know, we are not going to tolerate elected governments not recognizing Indigenous rights. I mean, Indigenous communities across Canada have been saying that for decades, but the governments are colonial governments that benefit settler Canadians in, in I think, proportionately in, in, in big ways. And I think those are the kinds of cultural shifts we need to, to really spark those changes in the law. That, those are my, my multiple cents, I guess, on that. Here, but, I also, but I also have to point out though that in my simple mind, the court is contradicting itself. On one, on one, on all rulings, he says, this, this is a communal and a collective right. And on the next case, they delegate only a select few to make that informed consent, which is the chief and counsel, which is not, you know, do we have a legal recourse on that? Yeah, it's, it's, that's a big question. It, the courts have been very inconsistent when it comes to, when it comes to that. And yeah, there has, I've seen studies done that have just kind of charted the inconsistency. So it's, it's a huge question, probably too big for tonight. That's, but it's certainly, certainly one that folks are, <laughs> are putting their minds to, and it comes up a lot. Well, we're just uh, knowledge gardening here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we could, if we could, uh, if we could dance into, we've got some questions here in the, uh, the, the public question and answer session, what we're, we're kind of into now, and a couple of real interesting questions that I think in, in very ordinary common sense language, we could get some clarity on. One came uh, from Peter, and Peter's highlighting the point that, at least in Nova Scotia, the, the element protection is really real, the Wilderness Protection Act. And when and the, the always the discussion about which piece of ground to protect is a wilderness area or whatever, is always based up between, you've got economic development on one hand and wilderness preservation on the other continually. And uh, Peter's observation, I think he's probably right, is that it, it always slants towards the development. Is there, in your opinion, a, a, another specific avenue other than the Wilderness Protection Act to protect a river? And uh, maybe the, the, the answer to be specific is the, 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 uh, his question of the St. Mary's River as a valuable salmon habitat. What, what, what's the mechanism other than just a wilderness protection area? I mean, I can take a swing at this one, but I don't know that uh, my answer is going to be 
that positive. Um, I, I think that the, the problem of regulatory capture sort of pervades uh, our, our provincial government and we see in numerous contexts, the problem of governments favoring economic development over environmental protection over um, the health of local communities and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, this is probably a situation that reflects Pierre Olivier's experience in trying to get uh, the, the province of Quebec to protect the Magpie River, um, given the influence of, of Hydro-Quebec in that instance. Um, I don't think, I mean, beyond getting the province to, to declare the St. Mary's River to be a wilderness protected area or, or a provincial park of, of some other kind, um, I am not aware of any mechanism to force legislative protection for a, a river like the St. Mary's River. Um, I don't. I don't honestly think that such a mechanism exists. Um, perhaps Pierre Olivier can can speak a bit to you know the kinds of campaigns that you could launch to encourage a municipality to make a declaration. That the river is protected, but of course, as, as Tina has covered in a lot of detail, those types of, of instruments are um, are vulnerable to being overridden by uh, higher level governments, for lack of a better term. Um, so sorry to to not uh, be super optimistic about that one, but uh, that's um, I think that's the best answer I can provide at the moment. The other question I have: Do you think is it is it possible? For, for, for citizens of Canada to, to force the government of drafting an ecological constitution, which would encompass our protection of our source of life. Yeah, we, I'd like to, that ecological constitution, I'd like to take that up in just a, in just a second, if we could. Pierre Olivier, you wanted to, you wanted to address this last issue? Yes, I, I wanted to, um... It's interesting, uh, Albert, you were mentioning um, uh, free power and informed consent, uh, the right of veto. Uh, that's an important question, in, in, even in the rights of nature movement. Uh, in, a, in the past, in a few years ago, I was on the board of a, an organization called the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, uh, who was granting forest, uh, sustainable forest certification um, certificates. Um, and we were, the organization was trying to push free prior and informed consent uh, a, little, a little bit further in the forestry world. And uh, FSC has four chambers, an indigenous chamber, an environmental chamber, uh, an industry chamber, and a social chamber, uh, mostly unions. And uh, we, we, we ended up, um, you know, and it's the same thing with the Magpie River. We end up, now that we're talking about designating guardians, uh, we're starting to think about the questions such as the one that you asked, who can actually give the consent? Um, this need of independence is really important. And there was a question in the um, that I saw that talked about the guardians and how they can be independent. And that's that's really interesting because that's that's concretely one of uh, some of the questions that we're facing right now. Who can actually you know talk for the river without having um, a conflict of interest or because because we 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 started thinking oh, okay could the the chief of the band council um, you know for example just thinking uh, could it be a could he be a guardian uh, and we we found out that maybe so in some cases it would be have a conflict of interest so it's really hard actually to find a, a person who can actually really speak for the rights of the river um, I mean it's not it's not necessarily difficult but uh, you have to look at the you know, yeah, the conflict of interest and and um, and there. If you look, at, we're starting also to look at the different structures of guardians because you you can have guardians who speak for the river. But uh, if you look at what has been done in New Zealand, you have different levels of guardians. Actually, you have the somewhat the spokesperson of the river, but you also have uh, different structures of guardians that uh, actually include uh, a variety of of. of stakeholders and, and interest. 
uh, and and so at, at some point you 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 end up with 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 comedies that maybe are not that different from from what you can see in in, in you know typical uh, land management um, uh, structures uh, so so I just I just wanted to say that uh, yeah the designation of gardens is uh, is more complicated than we thought and really needs to be uh, uh, well thought and uh, there are not a lot of examples in the world right now of uh, of, of these kind of structures or uh, so there's not a lot of, of inspiration but uh, it's really an important ingredient uh, of the recipe. Uh, th th thank you and and to continue that just a little on, on another question. A question that Nicole had is, is how, do, how do you move, what sort of strategy can you suggest, I suppose any of the speakers, to, to move beyond a declaration? Because it, it just seems like that, that, it's nice to get that done. Uh, but to move beyond a declaration, I think takes a strategy <clears throat> that, that I don't have the answer to. And I certainly didn't have it as a municipal counselor. I, 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 uh, was able to pass a declaration to, to call uh, for a climate emergency. And the next question is, okay, that's great. Now what? <laughs> so, so I mean, if some of you could elaborate on I mean, just to, to streamline it, how do you move beyond a declaration if you're able to get that done? W what are the components of it? What, what's the citizen activism piece? What's the political piece? What's the financial piece? To move beyond a declaration to really get it's come up in a couple of times with questions, good ideas here, but how do we give it teeth? And, and in terms of climate change, how do we give it teeth quickly? And the other thing I think that we have to remember is that when those legislations were drafted up in policies, our, our so-called environment was in a pristine condition. And we now know now this is far from it. So that should then give an opportunity for the citizens to demand that our, that our current legal system has to be revamped to be reflective of the current state of our environment at this very moment. Sarah, Tina, what, what's your, what's your take? What, what are the next steps beyond declaration that, 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 that we can understand, at least that I could understand? Well, maybe, maybe a start of answer. Uh... It's really through implementation of the declaration, and uh, I mean, I, I talked about our next steps being the, the nomination of guardians, but we are conscious uh, that if eventually uh, a case is brought in front of the courts um, about the Maikai River, um, this is going to be a game changer, and this this can be a, a test as well. Um, so. We don't we don't have any plans to to bring that in you know in front of court or engage into litigation because I mean uh, for us it's uh, as I mentioned earlier it's really uh, how would I say it's almost a, a, a unilateral declaration of the protection of the river in, in some way uh, but uh, I mean what you can think yeah next I mean the the, the next steps are really. From my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, but from what I understood that a, or a lawyer explained to us is that law is, we're creating new law. So, so there are different ways that this can actually be eventually integrated in, into our legal system. Uh, but our legal system is evolving uh, as, as society is evolving. And uh, we mentioned the paradigm shift. In my opinion, it's more a, a philosophical paradigm shift than a legal paradigm shift because Every time I talk to uh, journalists well, after we, we did this announcement, they were they were asking me, well, do you think that's a little bit too much to have at a river, you know, granted having having granted rights? And I was saying, my answer was always, you know what? In our legal system, corporations have rights, and corporations are purely, you know, imaginative entities that are you know related to humans. So so the paradigm shift is really going from anthropomorphism, you know, thinking from really a human-based perspective all the time to a, a more eco, eco uh, not sure how to translate that. I'm struggling, my, I'm struggling to Albert <laughs> speaking in a, in a second language from a, an, an eco-centric perspective where, you know, you, you talk about the humans uh, as a part of an ecosystem. So I don't know if I answered the questions, but uh, 
uh, it's, it, it can go a lot of ways, actually. Here's uh, here may be another way, uh, another way to look at it. We've got about uh, seven or eight minutes left here, but um, and uh, a, a document that I'm fond of. It was written by uh, Arthur Manuel and um, uh, Ronald Dickerson, who is the, the Grand Chief uh, over in in, uh, in BC. Uh, and a lot of their work led them to one conclusion. And I think that may be a first step. And it's certainly a question I have for perhaps a role for the Center for Local Prosperity or other N NGOs. They said that in the struggle to protect the land, indigenous people are the first and last lines of defense. But fortunately, we are not fighting these battles alone. Over the last two decades, indigenous people have been increasingly working in partnership with non-indigenous environmental organizations and individuals. So it's quite a, to, to broaden that level of partnership between I, I think here in Nova Scotia, Ecology Action Center, local municipality, Center for Local Prosperity. Is there a game plan that we can start to weave all of those voices together to support or play off of this treaty piece that seems to be so crucial? Um, <laughs> it's, it's a really big question. I don't think that I have uh, a, you know, a very specific answer for you. Um, I, I could say that I, I was really heartened when the, the Magpie River announcement came out to see that it was both a municipality and an indigenous governing body that had, that had issues issued these joint declarations. Um, and I do think that although we've seen in the US, we've seen a lot of um, municipal declarations be overridden by state governments, for example, I think that the addition of the, the, uh, the declaration by the Inu of Iquanichit um, in this particular case is, is really interesting. And, and that, you know, if, if it comes down to litigation over this, it'll be really fascinating to see what a court does with that. I think it's, it's so unique and so novel and so powerful um, that it'll, it'll be a real challenge for a court to, to grapple with that. And I think that that really adds a, a very uh, powerful persuasive layer to this, to this declaration. So I think that's a really fascinating example of that kind of partnership between Indigenous communities and, and municipalities and, um, you know, settler NGOs and that sort of thing. Um, so it's certainly something that I, that I would love to see uh, replicated in, in other areas in Canada. Um, sorry, I know, Gregory, that doesn't really answer your question about it. Oh, it does. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, certainly the, it's certainly the piece. I haven't thought about that as well, but I'm wondering before I speak if if maybe Albert would like to say anything on this topic. Uh, am I getting my simple thinking? The first obstacle we have to remove is that the government using this burden of proof in which any at any time we want to exercise our treaty and our region rights, it has to go to litigation known very well that most First Nations communities are, do not have the financial security. And we all know that you have to go to the provincial system first. And you know you're going to, you're going to lose there anyway. And then the next step will be the, the, the international you know, national Supreme Court. And that, that will cost millions. So uh, we're exhausting our limited resources, our limited financial resources, just trying to protect what the rights that, we, that, that have been reaffirmed. But each and every time, Canada, Canada takes this prerogative that by, by using this burden of proof, prove to us that you have a, a treaty in Aboriginal way, which has already been which already been answered to all these case, cases across the country. So that's, that's one area that I see. I think if we can address that and find, find a way in which we can bypass that 
burden of proof that, that, the, that the government and the courts have put upon us. And the other point he said, you know, I don't know how it, how it can come about, but since we are the only ones that have been legally and constitutionally recognized as having some rights, why can't, uh, why can't the resident use that to piggyback on our, on our special relationship by joining forces in some of these litigations? Because obviously that's, that's the only course of action that we have to get those, uh, get those uh, rights reaffirmed. We, we, can, we can't even begin to talk about, because with every right comes responsibilities. We can't even go there yet, yet because rights, we don't have rights, you know, humans don't have rights over nature. And, and according to some of our laws, laws like the laws of medical, that highlights and emphasizes over and over again what our responsibilities are. And that's to maintain the ecological integrity of the area, no matter what, no, no matter what. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, and to follow up on that, and we, we only have a couple of minutes, and maybe maybe we're not going to be able to, to deal with it too much. But but Nina had an Nina had a, an interesting question, uh, one of our participants, that even though we we do all this good work and get these laws in place, like like the Environmental uh, Endangered Species Act, it just seems like the government is just prepared to ignore that. Would that also be the case for these rights for nature? Is it just a matter of going through the work? And it's just ignored unless I think what Albert's talking about, the seriousness of this treaty law, is that, is that, the, uh, is that the, uh, the missing piece? So I'll say something because I had wanted to um, add a little bit to what, what Albert was saying. And, and I think it's related. Um, I mean, to Nina's point, I would say just generally, I think, Laws have power socially and culturally, even if they aren't enforced. I mean, laws are reflective of society and even when governments don't enforce them, they play an important role because you know, we have citizens coming out to say, no, actually we enacted these laws for a reason. They have a purpose. We're going to come together and say they matter. So I would say that, that the, the power of working from the grassroots to see laws enacted is powerful in and of itself, even if there's a very real chance that governments later on might not enforce them to, the, to their full extent. But to the treaty point and to what Albert was saying, and, and I recognize we're, we're running a long time here, I think I just want to say that, and again, you know, reiterating the point I made at the beginning, which is that I'm, I'm coming at this from a settler perspective, but also somebody who's had the, the great privilege of being able to you know, hear, hear Albert amongst others speak at great length about Ndugalimk and, and other other Mi'kmaq ecological legal principles and, and practices, I mean, and the privilege to have learned about a lot of that history through my legal education and career. It, the reality is, is that Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia and elsewhere in, in Mi'kmaq have been working for decades to, after the courts began to recognize rights, um, like Mi'kmaq rights to harvest and access resources, they've been working for decades to, to have governments recognize their, their corresponding right to implement governance practices and legal practices. And Nadukalim is one of the things that Albert has spoken about on the line. I mean, it has embedded within it, um, you know, there are, there are aspects of Nadukalim, as, as I understand it from what I've learned from Albert, that, that are analogous to what I think the Western legal framework has sort of phrased rights of nature, but that in and of itself is a kind of multifaceted concept that can take many different things. So, you know, when Albert says something like, you know, why not maybe piggyback on some of the litigation that we're doing, what I hear in that is, is, is a call for settlers to support Mi'kmaq rights initiatives, even if they don't look exactly like what looks like a kind of Western rights of nature, let's protect the specific river or let's, let's do this or that. I mean, to my mind, the, the, the sovereignty issues that we saw erupt last fall over the moderate fish, like the moderate livelihood fishery, those were issues that had embedded within them an aspect of a rights of nature movement because Mi'kmaq were asserting their right to practice and implement the Dukalim, which has embedded within it these conceptions of rights and responsibilities. So, so I think it's really important not to, not to, like for settlers and settler communities, not to come to Indigenous groups to say, here's this rights of nature conception, 
let's use your rights to help us achieve this, but rather to take a broader perspective and really to be supporting indigenous rights initiatives that are, um, that are sovereignty based and maybe that on the face of it seem more nebulous, but that are really important in terms of, of decolonizing Canada and, and creating the kind of legal space where, um, where the reemergence of treaty based nation to nation relationships is possible. And with that, maybe then ecological salvation as well. Thank you. It, it's a little past uh, nine o'clock. And I, I just want to say on, on behalf of the Center for Local Prosperity, Elder Marshall and Sarah, Pierre Olivier, Tina, I, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for giving up of your time to start this conversation. I think this is the beginning of a conversation as opposed to, to an ending point. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank all those participants that are uh, that out there that I, I'm not looking at right now, but they're out there and, and thank you all very much. Just two uh, quick thing. We've got two more dialogues coming up in this Thinkers Lodge dialogue series. One's on the 28th of July, and it, it's on living communities um, and, and inclusion in Atlantic Canada. We've got speakers, uh, Jason McClellan, who's a, an international architect, and uh, uh, Carolyn Sloan, who uh, uh, runs a, a center for people with disabilities, and Donna Crossland. Uh, we're going to talk about how do you build inclusive communities that include all the people and nature into new designs for communities in Atlantic Canada. And our last one is uh, August uh, 11th, uh, Crossing to Safety, Discovering the Common Home in Atlantic Canada. It's a big question that how do you determine the readiness piece? How ready is Atlantic Canada to accept climate refugees from any place else in the world to settle here, what are the legal issues, the political issues, the financial issues uh, of, of doing that? How do you determine if Atlantic Canada, if Canada is ready to be a receiving parcel? And Richard Reoc in, in, uh, in London, a uh, long history with uh, Amnesty International, Scott Lecky, Displacement Solutions in, uh, in um, Australia, uh, Cecilia Jimenez Damery, is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on, on internally displaced people in the Philippines. And Robin Bronin, who's a, an international lawyer in Alaska, that's been working with resettling indigenous people within the, the state of Alaska. So that, that's our last dialogue. And uh, again, I just, I wanna end by saying thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.